Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Afzalu salatu ve atamu teslim. Ala seyyidina ve maulana Muhammedin. Ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ecmain. Subhanaka la ilme lana illa ma'alamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakim. Beloved seekers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah, our gratitude is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having able us to be here, especially in this month of Ramadan, which is the month of Qur'an. And it is called the month of Qur'an because in it, it is a reflection of our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we look at this properly, all of our lives and all the stages in life that Imam al-Haddad has beautifully articulated and beautifully translated by Sheikh Mustafa al-Badawi, or Mustafa al-Badawi, eh, is, is actually a map for you to understand Al-Quran al-Kareem. So from the time that we were in, you know, the in the loins of Sayyidina Adam, that we took the uh, Mithak, is not just Ahad, like I've mentioned before, it is, uh, it is an oath which is very high, because in the Quran verse, we did not reply as na'am. But it is a verse that Allah to be rabbikum. And we replied as bala. So bala is a very high affirmation. So Allah is asking, am I not your Lord? If we say yes, it's as though we say you are not our Lord. You see? But we say verily, ya Allah. It is an affirmation. You are our Lord which means we have already replied with an affirmation that is our um, yeah, any, our oath with Allah, which we vaguely remember when we entered this dunya. And that is the reason why when we entered this dunya, it, Sayyidina Adam was worried and he asked, are my descendants going to receive uh, yeah, any guidance? And Allah says, Allah promises there will be guidance. And we're in a very blessed ummah. Yeah, any everybody who is born in this past fourteen hundred years is considered as ummah to Muhammad, whether they are they accept it or they don't. And the ruling is that if they have received the risala and they turn it down, then they'll be punished. But if they have not received the risala, or if they receive the Risala distorted, then they'll be forgiven. And this is in Imam al-Ghazali's Faisal at Afrika, on the boundaries of uh, theological, uh, it's a book by Imam al-Ghazali. <clears throat> so if we look at the works of Imam al-Haddad, it is actually reaching out to people, the works of Imam al-Ghazali. He made it even more palatable, because Imam al-Ghazali in himself He's a very huge ocean. Like, where do you enter from Imam al-Ghazali? The Sufis will have an understanding of who he is. The theologians would see Imam al-Ghazali as one facet. And then uh, the, uh, the jurists will see Imam al-Ghazali as another facet. Because, like example, people talk about Makasid Sharia in this day and age, which I feel it is... Uh, a, dist a distorted understanding of Maqasid al-Shari'a in this day and age. So, Maqasid al-Shari'a is not meant for the awab. And Imam Ghazali has books that he had written and this, he felt that some of the works of the jurists were only meant for the jurists. And even jurists were shocked that why are they teaching this to awab? So, Maqasid al-Shari'a is not for the awab. Because the Sharia is for the khas. And even for the khas, is, that means there are scholars who have reached a certain level, not just people who graduate from institutions. It's two different things. Two different grades of people that we're talking about. Proper scholars who understand uh, Sharia, not just people who graduate with the degree of Sharia. It's two different categories, you know. That being said, so Imam al-Ghazali, <clears throat> he, he makes the Qur'an 
approachable for us. Imam al-Haddad, I mean, if by reading the lives of men, we have not yet returned to Al-Quran, then I have been teaching you wrongly. Or it has not spurred you to be going back to worship, then I have not delivered this class properly or you have not been listening to it uh, correctly in that sense. Is everything okay? Okay. The Zoom, right? No. Okay, something else. Okay. I shouldn't be capo. Ignorance is bliss. So why why is Imam Al Ghazali important? Because he <clears throat> he has done a lot. So for us to approach Mithal, um, uh, let me see. So example, you want to know? Then there is um, there is Mizanu Amal, and then there's another book that he's written. Mir'atu uh, Mir'atu apa? Huh? No, Mir'atu is not Imam Ghazali. There's another book by him. So one is the theory. He talks about logic. Mantik. Another one, he talks about Mizanu Amal. What are the practical steps you need to do to achieve that? And then he, he lays down with a few other books in terms of... So that's like... um. Uh, one might say Islam in terms of you know then there's Iman the books of his Aqidah, um, the the Kawaidul uh, Kawaidul uh, Aqaid, which is the second part of Abu, yani Hiya al and then uh, Al Aftakat fi Al Aftasad, which is another book by Imam Al Ghazali that talks about Aqidah, and then the books that talk about Ihsan. The Imam Al Ghazali has written. One of it is Bidayatul Hidayah. Another one is Jawahirul Quran. And then the Arba'in. And then, you know, Ihya al -Mudin. So these are some of the books that Imam Ghazali has written. And how do we approach this? So Imam al-Haddad has made, uh, you know, because Imam Ghazali is very scholarly. So there are books that he meant for everybody. And there are levels that he pursues for the scholars because he's main aim is to correct the scholars because and i wish scholars today or people who are you know leading people would actually go out and learn and read imam al ghazali even more and then they can understand probably sheikh abdul qadir al jilani but if they can't do that at least they should approach imam al haddad that's most important uh -huh. so imam al haddad has done as a great favor by like example a summary of Ihya al Mudin is An Nasahatul Diniya wa Wasayatu Imaniya. Nasihat Agama wa Siyat Iman. Or uh, Sheikh Mustafa Badawi has translated as the Councils of Religion, right? Councils of Religion. Which is actually Imam, Imam al Haddad making a summary for Imam al Ghazali's Ihya al Mudin. And that book was widely read at one point of time in all of our masajids. Not one masjid would not teach that book. Most of the masajids in Singapore would learn that book. Uh, like when Ustad Abdullah al-Jufri was around, the books like Peringatan, Peringatan Umur Insan, which is the lives of men, would be widely taught. And then Ustaz Sigawth is still continuing to teach this in masajids. Minhajul Abidin was a book that was widely taught and learned in masajids. It was a book that would encourage people <clears throat> to worship God. It is a manhaj, the way for the worshippers. But what do we have today that are programs for masajids? The four weeks, five weeks, that's not sufficient. How then do we fit in human development? So basically, human the phases of human development, child, adulthood, adolescence, senior, how does Masajids address this not only by adding on fittings for the wheelchair people. I mean, as much as that is, mashallah, a leap forward, having elevators, etc. But what kind of classes would help people in, to aid in their different phases in life? And if you, you don't have to go far. I think just covering lives of men would be just that part. Let's say this part we cover for the seniors. Let's take this part and we cover for the youth. And this part we cover for... It's more than sufficient. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
I was watching a documentary yesterday. It's all related to the text. Don't worry. I'm not I'm not blabbering. <laughs> I was watching a documentary yesterday about this uh Ahmad Sukri, Shuk Sukairi or Sukri. I forgot his name. Is this Saudi TV presenter? So he went to Finland to look at how Finland in the 90s they had a um a huge problem with the youth. Uh the youth was it in fin Iceland or Finland? I think it was Iceland in the 90s. So youth were just prevalent with drugs. So much so they didn't know what to do. They would take the youth and put them all in one place and just throw them all there. Drugs, sexual offense, robbery, gang, you, you name it, they do it. So the, the citizens uh, got together and they said, we need to address this. So citizens then took and they created youth centers. They said, the youth have a lot of energy and we need to bring it all out. So they restructured the life of the youth for them. They played sports, they interacted with them, etc. Um, and this TV host from Saudi went to Saudi and looked at these models because I think Saudi Arabia is going through a lot of this. Lah. It's sad because a lot of young Saudis now are moving from religion, a deen, to superstition. So they would delve in like Ouija boards and all these kind of things, which is actually not just superstition, it's witchcraft. The, the very thing uh, that is missing in the Middle East right now, I won't say throughout, but some parts where it becomes so developed, etc., is that they don't know how to mature spiritually. But everything was just haram. Everything was very literal. Ghazali was bid'ah, etc. So... <clears throat> So they, they, then they, they interviewed one, I think, like a youth or stars and they're talking about, yeah, we need to do more of these sports and all that kind of thing. But if we look at the book, Narcissism Epidemic, and by now, the people who talk about Narcissism Epidemic, the teens that were back in the early 2000s, they now would probably be in their, what, my age, 40s, 50s, you know, like you know, four decades, four decades, eh? What's that, 40 years? Eh? 20, then 20 then or 20 now, they will be almost 40, 50. <clears throat> yeah. So what happened is they, they're not going to enter into the age of what? They're going to end the youth. And they're going to enter into the age of seniority. What are they going to bring? If they grew up with my Sweet 16 MTV Challenge, if they had the idea of um, uh, this is how I'm supposed to do my birthday bash, it's all about me, iPod, iPad, everything is about me. And then when they reach seniority, they have lost all that energy now to take drugs, to go for nightclubs, to go for raves, and to go for whatever it is. What are they going to do now when life is empty? There's no youth club that's going to take them in. right? Those youth clubs are now with new and new youth. So they're going to feel there's this gap then. And many people will go through this unless and until they start early with spirituality and religion. <clears throat> and by spirituality, I don't mean just tariqa. Uh, I think uh, one of them was asking, um, like, is tariqa, uh, you know, they feel like they are, how do I say that, pressured to join to tariqa. It shouldn't be pressured. It should be uh, a process where you feel and you understand that this is a natural process of spiritual development, not pressured. If it's pressured, then, then it is uh, It's not going to work. Lah. Anything that you're pressured to do that doesn't come from the passion is not going to work. Halas. So again, um, what we call this um, uh, any, the very thing that I try to avoid, fanatism. Fanatism will not bring anything out. Fanatism will not bring goodness out in anything. So it must be done with both dalil akli or nakli, and then it must be a process of developing the intuition. Because that's how you're going to age. And that's how you should age. We all should age. So uh, we went through a process where it was just dunya, like the, the Iceland case of the youth, or was it you? And then Saudi, the guys from Saudi thought they could implement this in Saudi. But actually, we already have that answer. Imam al-Haddad spoke about that answer. 
400 years ago. Imam Ghazali spoke about it many years ago. If you just go back to our books of Torah, it is all there. Because these people who wrote this book, they too had a youth. But how did they then spend their youth? Example, the work riyad, the word riyadah. Riyadah is the word of what? What does it mean in modern Arabic today? Riyadah. Exercise, sports, right? Training. But in, in traditional Arabic, what does it mean? To exert oneself into riyadha, which is like a spiritual work for the nafs. But it also means to exert oneself or to exercise to be part of a, a spiritual or a sport. Which means there's a certain secretness in physical activity. There's a there is sacredness, not a certain. There is sacredness, because why? You need to take care of your physical self in order to be able to benefit from it spiritually. So if you just take the physical aspect, which what we see today in this day and age, where people are just you know going around and they are parading their bodies in terms of like this is how I work out and this is how I do it and look at how flat everything is on me, like from here to here, semua flat lah. Tak ada, dia tak gemuk pun. Flat, everything is slim. You know, it's not natural. It's not natural at all. But if you, they have lost the spiritual essence of sports, which is actually the process of sports spiritually is to reach to a point of itkan, mastery. And Rasul Sallallahu says he praises those who do things with mastery, itqan, which is actually the next, the step before chivalry, what we've been discussing every Monday when we talk about futua. So Imam, Imam al-Haddad, when he talks about this process of uh, reaching seniority, you must remember that it encompasses all of this. Imam al-Ghazali, when he talks about uh, teaching tasawwuf and tariqah, etc., our mashaykh, they, it encompasses all of this. It is not just a process of fanatism, because fanatism is not healthy at all. And that is the reason why I have classes. That's the reason why I, I, I talk about the amal, I talk about the wirid, I talk about things. Because so that we don't follow blindly, but we understand with it through a reason why these are important for us. Process of reason. I mean, if you look at it, Imam Ghazali is someone who is a master of logic. But at the same time, we see, and we understand, that Mashaykh says logic is only the, the, the topic of logic or the, the subject of logic is only for those who don't have logic. But people who have reached to a point of intuition, yani kashaf, that they don't need logic anymore. Because that is the peak of knowledge. That's what I was talking about yesterday, right? So logic is for the awam. How do we understand kashaf? You still need knowledge. So very few people can skip knowledge and straight away go into kashaf. It's almost impossible. So the journey of the guide and tasawwuf and Imam al-Ghazali and Imam al-Haddad, Shah Abdul Qadir al-Jalani and your suluk, etc. is to bring you to a point that you reach to a level of kashaf because without mukashafa, there would not be mahabbah left. <clears throat> so how are you going to age? Because the next topic is what? Seniority, right? Let's read. No, it will be... Until 6.30, say bubar. Seniority, he says, right, he says, Malhadad says, the man moves on from manhood to seniority. And again, uh, why manhood covers womanhood? Now there's this thing, right? Modern uh, thing, you cannot say men. You must say woman, right? Why? Because in the men, there's the X and Y chromosomes. Lah. Like if I, I just did my DNA test. Okay? So they said that clearly, and this is a supposedly a non-binary company, uh, they said 
only the male uh, DNA can trace back the lineage. The Y, well, the female DNA cannot. So there's already sexism in DNA. So the man, the man has both X and Y chromosomes. So the men understand. Men understand women, but women don't necessarily understand men because they don't have that chromosomes. <laughs> Goes back to the hadith, right? That the female from the rib of Sayyidina Adam alayhi wasalam. Yeah. No, that, that hadith cannot be cannot be narrated too many times. They will rip me up. <laughs> it's sad. That example, I just learned this. Uh, zawj. Allah created everything in pairs, right? So the every Arabic word for zawj is to marry of the opposite gender. You get what I'm trying to say? That's the the lexiconal meaning of zawj. Mutazawj. That means to marry someone from the opposite gender. Now, we're trying, we're living in a world where everybody says it's non binary, which means the word zauj already means what? Bi? Binary. Okay? And then every, Allah has mentioned in Surah Yasin that He created everything in pairs. Everything that is created will be in what? Pairs. So the only non binary one is who? So for people who, Muslims especially, who wants to be non-binary, they're trying to be like who? Yeah, why you look shocked? Amalina, okay, right? Huh? Realization. But it's just simple things like this. Allah has settled this in the Quran already. If we we understand this, then the tak payah I mean, scholars have mentioned that there are people who are born like they feel that they are more women than men. I mean, scholars do acknowledge this, but these are very small numbers. The rest, according to them, are people who, because of environment, they habitually became like that. So, and in fact, if you look at it, um, Muslim societies have always been tolerant towards uh, people who have feminine feelings uh, and they are more feminine. I think Muslim societies um, unlike other because you see them in India a lot there are even just tariqas, Sufi groups that just take care of them they're just on their own uh, they are because they acknowledge that there are some some people who are naturally like that but not suddenly everybody becomes naturally like that. Then there's something wrong with the environment that we live in. You get what I mean? It's this uh, something. And the doors is always through Tawbah. But you cannot fight. You cannot fight. Al Quran, Quran already says that it is binary. You cannot say that it is non binary because the only one that is non binary, according to just the scripture, is Allah because it's neither male nor female. He is not created. Huh? Okay. Six o'clock. Seniority. And then man moves from manhood. Okay, that's why we stopped, right? Because I was explaining the word manhood. Huh? To seniority. Shekhuna. Huh? Shekhuna. Uh, Shekhucha. Uh, which, according to Ibn Jawzi, extends from 50 to 70. Huh? So I'm still youth. Second part of my youth. This is right. In fact, this is the peak. When you enter your 40s, you are at the peak. So you should be able to use your wisdom. 35 onwards is the prime of the second part of youth. So before 35, there's still a lot of things that would need to be developed in terms of its intuition. So there's a lot of struggle. So once the person enters 40 or reaching 50, and if they have been taking care of themselves spiritually, they would start to taste nafs mutma'inna even more. So between 
the shabab, the first youth, from puberty to youth, they would start to feel the nafsul ammar. And then when they study religion, they practice it, and this is where they start to see the world as a trap. This is they, they start to feel, feel nafsul lawama. This is the riyadha, it comes into play every day. That's where you need to get the suluk, the zikr, the 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 knowledge, knowledge especially is very important. Especially knowledge, I feel in Islam that it's not much covered in this day and age. Is this only certain teachers? I mean, I'm not saying oh, I'm someone. I mean, it's sad. I I wish more teachers teach this book, Lives of Men, and actually spend more time in it. We're doing it almost every day, and we're not even through the second chapter because there's a lot to cover if you think about it. It is the stages of our life that is very important. So the nafs lawama is the most integral. How do you tame the nafs until it reaches to the point that you are safe? You're safe because you enter seniority. Your physical self starts to win out. And that's where you enter nafs al-ammara, nafs nafs mutmainna Can you expedite the process? A question put on board by by Do they need help? Yeah. Can we expedite the process? Um, there's no expediting, but we can ask Allah for uh, to beautify to make it easy for us. And if He decides to open it for us to the 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 easier level of nafs, that's T. Oh, I put it. Oh, okay, Masha. Oh, okay, thank you. Come have a seat. Thank you. <clears throat> so, the the dhikr will open insights for us to understand nafsul lawama. So, from nafsul ammara, the ibadah, the dhikr, etc., will open up doors for us to understand that. And then, from nafsul lawama to nafsul mutma'inna. And then, the process of this, the reason why knowledge and zikr is really, really important. Uh -huh. Thank you, both of you. God exalted and said, then he brings you forth as a child, then that you attain you, your full strength, and afterwards you become old. Though some of you die before, and that you reach an appointed term that you may understand. So, yeah, any, you work? So, it is really important for us to understand that Allah has given us this youth. How are we go How are we using that energy of the youth? Like if you were to, you know, if I were to able to meet my 21-year-old self again, what would I tell my 21-year-old self? And most of you here are below 30, so that question doesn't mean anything much. La. My 21-year-old is probably two years ago, five years ago, so it's still quite okay. People like us, it's almost 20 years ago. What would we tell our 21-year-old self? And these are things that you need to... Now that you are here, don't wait till you're 70. If only I told myself that age ago, that age ago. So, because you have the strength now, the five before five is the rule of life. Health before illness, strength before weakness, Richness before poorness, uh, youth before old age, and life before death. And, you know, successful are those who are able to begin the life, the manhaj al-abideen, the life of worship, 
a young age and that they get their reminders young and that they get uh, they get not just reminders but they are guided to the path at an early age that's the reason why when the, the hadith that says you know when you see someone who's younger think that they're better than you because they have lesser sins and when you see someone who's older think better of them because they had more time to worship Allah than you so both has advantages but if they use their life with hikmah, like what Imam al Haddad has mentioned. So this hikmah is how are you using these faculties that you have right now for goodness and not to create the heaven on earth. Because what the world is doing today is <clears throat> trying to sell you heaven on this earth. What Imam al-Ghazali and Imam al-Haddad is trying to tell us, heaven is never meant to be on earth. Heaven is in the heavens. Her earth is a place that you suffer, that you go through hardship, that you go through, you know, challenges. And that is the reason why today we get a lot of people with depression because they are seeking for heaven on earth. And this is the postmodern, uh, yeah, any psycho, uh, the postmodern philosophy of life, lah. The well, you got that, eh? postmodern philosophy, eh? Not philosophy, eh? Not philosophy. Ah, philosophy, lah. Sorry, very slow today. Yeah, that's our worldview. How you map your mind. You know, there was once this, um, this was it French. This Italian, um, this Italian person, he went to China and he met the king. And he showed the king the world map. And of course, the world map back then showed that uh, Europe was high up. And then Asia and China was all down. So when the Chinese king saw this, he was angered. Why? Why was he angry? Not only that, because China was supposed to be the Middle Earth, the Middle Kingdom. Yeah, any the whole world is supposed to be around China, not below China, around. So the king was a bit upset, and that's what he wanted. He wanted to sell this image to the king, that he knew what something the king didn't. So, what kind of image of life have we been sold? We've been sold that kind of image that we are the Middle Kingdom. Everything revolves around us. Right? The, the postmodern world is such that everything revolves around, around you, around us. Why? Because you're the consumer. So I must delight you, make you feel good, sell you heaven on earth. Now imagine if you grow old having this idea that the world revolves around you. That the world revolves around you because you are the middle kingdom, right? So everything must revolve around you. The idea is to create this heaven on earth so that you don't see beyond, beyond what? Yourself, not even the earth. You don't see beyond your own self. You only see yourself. And this, when the strength of the self is taken away, the ego, right? The ego lives on the strength. And when the physical strength starts to win and you enter into your seniority and then you realize that you have no more power to create heaven on this earth for yourself, then you start to suffer. And this is, <clears throat> this is the utopian, godless world that the current world is trying to sell you. And there's passive aggressiveness to this. There is aggressiveness to this. There's everything to this. I mean, people take it either with passiveness or they do it with aggressiveness. 
that I want to create my own heaven. I want to create my, my heaven in my own room. Because they literally took Jannat, Baiti Jannati. They literally took that and they tried to make that. But what makes Jannah Jannah is Allah's Rida. Allah must invite you into that Jannah. You can't create Jannah. If you can't create Jannah, then who are you? God. So I must have my this and that and this and that. Where else the house of the Prophet وسلم, was such that it, it was not even his house. It was the house of Sayyidatina Aisha radiallahu anha. He did not tell us to create the heaven on earth. That is a that is an idea, that, that is an aqidah that was sold to us. Like, you know, we have the American dream. We're starting to have this even for our own country now. Right? We, we want to have our own way of doing things. We have to have a way of thinking, of doing this and that. What happened to the world as a village? Right? We had that in the 90s. But the whole world is a village. The whole world is one big village. No more. No, I am my own village. We, we're starting to think like the Middle Kingdom. And then when everything else is cut off, how are you going to grow old? Right? At this time, the earliest signs of weakness begins to appear. Strength recedes. Strength recedes. And the period from fifth, from 6 to 70 is that which the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam wa sallam and call the battleground of death. The battleground of death. So this is where death uh, starts to become a reality of a person. And many people, believe it or not, are not ready to face death yet. And uh, that's the reason why Imam al-Ghazali places this uh, dhikr al-mawt. Where? Where does he place dhikr al-mawt in his ihya? I spoke about this yesterday. At the end. It's the last chapter in ihya al -Muddin. The first chapter is what? Knowledge. The ignorant would not be able to face their death. So it's not just about worship. Everybody can pray. Swarang can pray. But do they have the knowledge to understand Allah? The knowledge to understand themselves? The knowledge to understand the inner dimensions of worship? The knowledge to understand uh, the illusions of the heart? Like what I was saying, what the world is trying to sell you. Uh, to create the heaven on this earth so that you think that you can live forever. We all not, no one is going to live forever. So how then are you going to prepare for this short journey? We're just here on a journey. And this is what Imam al-Haddad is saying, is a battleground of death. And he also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the reaping of my nation is between 60 and 70. So between the age of 60 to 70 is the time you should be reaping what? The benefits of your work, <clears throat> of your ibadah, of your knowledge of God. Don't, what is, you know, um, you know, ulama mentioned, tala'a, you take one kitab and you tala'a, is better than doing 1,000 rakats. That means you open the kitab and you study the kitab. It's better than doing alpha rakaat. 1,000 rakaat. So that is the reason why we're having knowledge, we teach. So that you don't do 1,000 rakaat for whom? For yourself. This is what Imam Ghazali mentions in, in Minhaj al-Abidin. He says, a man's outer action cannot be sound unless be known the effects of inner actions on outer ones and knows 
how and from which of the inner actions he should keep himself aloof. Yani, what are the effects of the internal self that would destroy your ibadah? And what are the effects of the external self that would destroy the heart within? And this is where Imam Ghazali places it in the third uh, of the quarter of Ihya. Uh, when Aja'ib al when he talks about the what? The illusions that the nafs would cast upon us. And these illusions become a reality if you don't tackle them at an early age. And that's why Imam Haddad says, he quotes the hadith, you know, by the time if you reach 40, if you don't get your ibadah life, your religious life into order, then goodbye to you. Although, of course, people might say there are chances and all. Yeah, but 40, Allah has given us 40 years. 40 years is a long time. If you're in your 20, then know that you're already halfway through the journey. If you have already reached 40, like what he has mentioned, he says, every morning there is a bird that announces from the fourth heaven. He goes out from the fourth heaven and he says, Oh people of 40, you are a crop whose, har crop whose harvest is nigh. That means by 40, people, you must be able to reap your harvest ready. Oh people of 50, what have you sent ahead of you? Yeah, any what ibadah have you done? Nebuchadnezzar, this is not the qadha. This is already that you have prepared yourself in the that you're going to bring forward. And what have you kept back? Oh, people of 60, you have no excuse. People of 60, you have no what? Excuse. Would that creature have never been created? When created, they know why they are created. The hour has come to you, O oh beware. That means by 60. Ajal is just here. Of course, Ajal can come to those who are 20 as well. doesn't matter. But if we are able to reach 60, then know that Allah has given you so much fadl. If you are able to reach 40, then Allah has given you fadl, 50, fadl, goodness, barakah. In life, he's been patient. Then after that, what are you going to do with yourself? These are strong reminders and that's the reason why books like this are not as popular as they used to be. Because it clashes with the modern mind. The modern mind tells itself that it needs to what? Create the heaven on earth. The closest we can get to heaven on earth is Majalisi to Zikr. And the Rawdah of the Prophet That's it. Everything else is not heaven and earth and will never be. And that too, if we are able to take care of the adab when we enter such places, when we are able to be given the... Uh, that's the reason why adab means discipline. It doesn't just mean etiquette. It means discipline. How do we discipline ourselves so that when we enter the age of 60 to 70, we're not fudul. Fudul ma'ana people that are foolish or they're just um, taking care of the affairs of others. So fudul, may Allah protect us from that. The reaping of my nations is between 60 and 70. It was at this age that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moved away, passed away at the age of 63. As did Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Umar, Sayyidina Ali, with, may Allah be pleased with them all. As for Uthman, he lived past 80. Okay. So most of them, they got the sunnah of passing away at 63, except for Sayyidina Uthman. And that too because he had a reason to still be here to take care. And he was invited by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Uthman, won't you do your iftar with us today? This is Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. Even that, how did he? His nights, you know, one raka'at is the whole Quran. It's something that you cannot even, you can't do. It takes, you know, there was someone uh, who tried to do one 
one day khatam al quran <coughs> and it took him about 7 hours another sheikh took about 14 hours so there was this sheikh uh, in the middle east he khatam al quran every day so he spends about 7 hours to 8 hours someone asked him he said no this is not for you he tried it that person took 14 hours which means what it's the fadl from Allah. If Allah wants to give to that person, it's from that person. So by the time you reach that age, by 40, you cannot say, I am the one who's praying. I am the one. Then you have fallen for the trap. It's a very sticky trap. You cannot get out. In the injury, it's trap. Because that I will not leave you until you leave to 70. Because like Minhaj, what he has mentioned, you don't know. You know, about what is external that is causing the in illness internally and what internally is causing the defects of your external worship. Allah won't accept it. Like Imam Al Ghazali, he's very, very strict, mashallah. He's not just Imam of Tasawwuf, but he's also Imam of Sharia and Maqasid and all these great things that we talk about. Imam Al Ghazali was the champion of it, mashallah. He says in his Bidayatul Hidayah, a prayer without khushu is not accepted. Only the parts that you are khushu is accepted. This is what he said. So out of the four raka'ans of Asar, how many of it were we khushu? And then how many of it was not? That's the portion that is accepted. The part that we are khushu in. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Did we not grant you a life long enough for him who reflects to reflect therein. Tadabbur. Tadabbur. And a warner came to you. And he said, you know, Muhammad Wasallam. So it is important for us to be able to sit and reflect Tadabbur. And this is one of the uh, requirements for us when we study Al-Quran. Abdullah, I'm making dada cross it is. Al-Quran itself as the Prophet وسلم, has mentioned, eh, that what could take away the rust of the heart is the reciting of Al Quran. That means one of the dhikr that could take away the rust in the heart is what? Reciting Al Quran. And one of it is also what? To contemplate on the verses of Al Quran. And what more if we are able to reflect on the words that were mentioned? So that's why there's three math there's three speeds of reading Al Quran, right? What is the three speeds? Tartil, Tahrik, Hadar. Yes, any Tartil is to recite slowly, which also means eh, it goes back to the word Tilawa, which also means to practice and to read to, to read. And to practice, huh? and to obey. Correct. Practice like obey. Correct. Eh? So tilawa is not just to tilawa to the Quran, but to obey the Quran. So there's three speeds: the fast, the medium, and eh? the fast speed. But all, of course, with tajweed. And this also, when it comes to the verses that talks about the uh, the wrath of Allah. Then we should be reciting with with humility. When it comes to verses that talks about promises and hopes, then we should be reading it with delight. For those who understand, especially when they read Al-Quran. And when there are verses that talks about prayers, we should be making dua. So the Quran is a book that, you know, when you recite, we should understand Kalam Rabbi. This is the speech of my Lord. How do we approach the Quran? So it's not just about speeding through, but it is about what? Having the ability to contemplate. And reading the Quran is wajib. Reading the Quran is what? Wajib. If a person doesn't have a wirid from the Quran, then what kind of person is that person? At least, you know, we should have a wirid from the Quran. 
one ain ke eh one page ke two pages ke eh you need to have be making zikr with al al quran every day every day not just once a week not just when you come for majlis uh we recite yasin together that's just that is just the wirit of the week but what about the wirit of the day that's important eh? there was one of the reciters of quran from whom we receive our qiraat uh, of warash and what's the name of the reciter i forgot the reciter's name it's okay it was mentioned that when he he was the imam of masjid nabawi for about 60 years this is many years this first 300 less than 300 years of the hijri and it was mentioned that when he he speaks the smells of musk the reason being because he had a dream that the prophet sallam spat into his mouth so from then henceforth whenever he speaks it would emanate the fragrance of musk huh? ah imam nafi Imam Nafi, the Imam of Medina. What did he say? Nafi, Imam Medina, Imam Nafi. When he speaks, it emanates musk. Not because he's fasting and Allah says those who are fasting, not based on that hadith. Entirely in his life, because he preserved the way he recites Al Quran, because he knows it is the Prophet. But if we recite it because we want to hear and hear ourselves sound good, then selamat lah. Those are the people that Imam Al-Ghazali has warned about. And in fact, one of the signs of al Akhir Zaman is people who sing the Quran, who make it into a tune like the flute, according to Rasul Wasallam. And that's what we're getting today. People who sing Al-Quran precedes those who have knowledge. You get what I'm trying to say? In fact, to be Ahlul Quran, you, you don't need to have Arabic, but you need to have that relationship with Quran. And this is sadly what a lot of people don't like to hear today. Because it's mentioned by Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. He says in one of his dreams where he met Allah, he says, Ya Allah, how do your awliya become your awliya? This is Imam Ahmad, who himself is an awliya. He says, Allah says, by reciting my Quran, with understanding or no? Allah says, with or without understanding. So, it is not about singing the Quran. It is about this tatabur. If our Qurans at home are dusty, then know that on the day of judgment, the Quran will ask, why have you not read me? And how are you going to answer? When you can spend time watching all the all the what? Anything that we do. Lah. Like I said, it takes seven hours to complete the whole Quran. For those who are, Allah given the tawfiq, if not 14 hours, that means almost half of the day. Okay? How many of you want to try that? Or do we just put it, put it off our lichi? Huh? If it is the second, then know that the heart is not attached yet to the Quran. Allah baca ikhlas, you can senang. It's different. There was once I saw this on the internet. It was a chain mail. Last time there were chain mails. Okay, this is back in the days when I was running um, um, e uh, email groups for my grandfather's classes. So um, back when I was in NS, before that as well. So there was this chain mail that went on about reading Al Quran. So he, there was this person that he has uh, a basket and uh, he went uh, and someone, you know, the senior said to the younger man, go and fetch water with this basket, with this old basket, which is old and dusty, you know. This, the guy said, what water can the basket hold? Just go. So he went to fetch, came back, there was no water and then the like the uncle, I said, do it again. So he did it over and over again. And then he said, but there's no water. He says, yeah, but isn't the basket now clean? Yes, it is. 
This is the effect of those who recite Al-Quran. Whatever that was dirty, when you keep reciting Al-Quran, the old basket becomes what? Like, like new. I mean, it's from the internet. It was, it was chain mail. You guys don't even hear this anymore. Right? But it's it's stuck in my head because it's such an important teaching. But provided we're not arrogant about it, about our worship, like what Imam Al Ghazali has mentioned. Right? Cannot be until you're 70 and 80, you're arrogant about your, your worship. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. It is said that the age referred to is 60. While the warner is the Quran or the Prophet وسلم, or the grey hair. So one of the warner of death, of maut is what? Shaban. Shaban ma'na, white hair. The people, they have white hair means what? Maut is coming. This is what Imam Busiri mentioned. The white hair gave me a warning but I did not heed it. So even if you start to see one small white hair, and maybe because it's of chemical nature of the food that we're eating, whatever it may be, lah, it's still a white hair. The sunnah is it would it's supposed to remind us of what? Of mood. Yeah. So and the Quran is supposed to remind us of mood. So mood is not. Uh, you see, we have this dunya thinking. Mouth is not good. Mouth is wrong because we have the wrong remembrance of death. Why? Because we live with the mind that wants to create paradise on this earth. Which is impossible. We can never create paradise in this dun dunya. Mustahil. Rumahku, syurgaku, tak ada. Baiti jannati. That's what, that is hadith, isn't it? No, is it a saying? It's a saying. And that's why they ask you to buy glass and metal furniture. For those who know, brass and metal, apa lagi? Um, letak seribu. Macam-macam name lah, they come out with this kind of things. Just to make your house have some Laura Ashley kind of thing. But I mean, we are naturally we are home proud people. People who are proud of our homes, which is good. Uh, homes that does ibadah, we should have some of this, but not to the extent that it becomes excessive and extravagant, lah. Excessive and extravagant, like we need to have a super huge screen TV or uh, Da Vinci chandelier. Even Da Vinci is not out of business. Yeah, you don't remember. Right? All these kind of things. Why? Because there's always competition. First is the Renaissance, and then now is the minimalist. After that is just tikka. Aja. They'll sell you a tikka that is made out of straw, $500. Handwoven from India, they say. But they bought it from the guy, 500 rupee. Organic straw, they'll tell you. It's, but you have this idea that you're create, creating this utopian desert feel. That, that's what they're selling you, an experience. But when moat comes and you go back like the desert, now what are you gonna what what are you going to bring? Nothing will follow you. Not even your jasad will follow you because your jasad will decompose. The jasad will decompose. So not even your jasad will follow you. So what are you going to bring for that? And that is the reason why when we study Akida, we must start to make friends with the warners, those who warn us. Here being whom? Who are the warners? You don't have the book. Why do you the book? Okay, who are the warners? Ini bawa lain buku. 
Well, who are the warners? Huh? Quran lagi. Messenger and the grey hair. If all three has appeared and we still have not taken heed, then there is no fourth warning because the fourth one, Malakat Maut himself will come. And how are you going to receive him? Hopefully, we receive him with salam, but we must be prepared. Right? Okay. And then, God has, which means he has left him no way of excusing himself by saying that the end came too soon and his life was too short. So no one can say that, ah, my mouth come too soon lah. Or, my life was too short. Life is meant to be what? Short. That's why you have to play hard. That's what Reebok says. Now all these brands, they play around with your life, you know. Life short, play hard. Now I don't know which other company uses this, but it was a sports brand that used this. Life short, play hard. Or, just do it. So there's no need to think, no need for knowledge, no need for God, there's no need for right or wrong, no need for ethics. Just, just do it. Like, you know, party all night long. These are the things that has been uh, propagated to us. Entertainment is important. It's okay if we have to spend a few hundred dollars to watch a certain celebrity or an art thing or something like that. But it's not okay for us to spend a bit of time not even asking for money to stay up for Laylatul Qadr. You see? I mean, we probably stay up if we see a celebrity doing it. Oh, uh -uh lah. Celebrity ni pun, dia pun sebayang. Malam 27. I pun nak sebayang. That's our life today. We are inspired by people of Dun. Not the warners. Like Imam Haddad has mentioned. Who are the warners? The Prophet Wasallam. The Quran and the Shaiban, the white hair. And if we're not heeding this warner, don't blame Allah. Death came too soon. Your life is a risky. The people who are dead, who have died, they said, if only we can come back to life just to say one subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. That means they are already dead and they want to come back just to say this once. And we have this opportunity right now in Ramadan to be making tasbih, tahmid, tamjid, tahlil to Allah. How many opportunities of this we're not taking, we're not doing. And those who are dead, they envy us who are still living. And that is the reason why if you read uh, Ibn Qayyum's Kitab al ruh so if you have all this question about do the dead receive our rewards, go and read Ibn Qayyum, Kitab al ruh He's mentioned this. You know, how do the people who are dead, do they receive your rewards? How do they react towards your rewards and all of this? They, they see it, you know, for those who do not go with Amal, they are kubur adda. And even one Fatiha that is recited by the stranger upon the whole Kubur, that one Fatiha, people will rush out to take it. And that will be the sustenance for them. It's because we are not aware of the afterlife yet. But we have the three warners. Who are the three warners? Quran, Rasul, the white hair. It should be sufficient to tell us that we need to do ibadah such that when we enter the kubur, there will be no questioning. And that what we have to do is like the story I've recited, shared with you, is that this lady, her daughter dreamt of her mother. Her mother died. And the daughter dreamt of her mother. 
And then he asked, what did Allah do to you, O Ummi? And then the mother was like, I waited for Munkar wa Nakir to come, but they didn't come. I waited and waited and waited. The angels didn't come. So I got up and I pushed the, the wall around me because it seems that it was not strong. I pushed and I saw another place. I saw another place. And this place uh, it was beautiful. So I walked towards the place <clears throat> and I saw there were other ladies around and I said, where is this place? And they say, I have the barzakh. This is barzakh. And she says, well, I've been waiting for Munkar wa Nakir. He didn't come. And then the lady smiles and she says, this is the jannah for people without hisab. This is the jannah for people without hisab. Like I've shared another story, right? Of these two brothers. So one of the elder brother passed away. The elder brother passed away and then, you know, he dreamt, the younger brother dreamt and says, Ya Akhi, what did Allah do to you? And he says, well, Alhamdulillah, you know, after I've passed away, I didn't know I passed away. So until I reached the Kubur, I, I thought I was sleeping. So I woke up and I look for my siwa because he has this habit of sleeping. Before he sleeps, he would siwa. And when he wakes up, <coughs> he would siwa and he would recite the dua after waking up. Alhamdulillah, ladhi ahya ba'da ma'amatuna wa lahil nushur. It's a long, there are many duas upon waking up. This is the basic one. So, I, I saw two guys coming. One in front, one behind. That's how Munkar and Nakir will come. These are how the two angels will come. They will come in this method and they will, one will stand in front. So, the angels were looking at this man because he turned right and left. He was looking for his what? Siwa. And then the angel said, what are you doing? I'm looking for my siwa. Why are you looking for your siwa? You're already dead. So he got scared. What did he say? He, he said, he started reciting, Alhamdulillah, he ladhi ahaya ba'da ma'amatana wa ilahi nushur. Alhamdulillah, he ladhi ahaya ba'da ma'amatana wa ilahi nushur. Then the angel said, you're obviously someone who's pious. I'm not going to question you. Ya kak hijalan. If for 70 years you do that, okay. If 70 years, kita tidur tak bangun-bangun. When the angels come, how do you think they're going to... Because you must understand. How many of you go to the... Oh, if all left to all doctors. You go to the ER, right? Emergency room. How many hours do you have to wait? On a busy day. Or oh, 10 hours. You've waited for 10 hours. SubhanAllah. Some more? Six hours. We have to do something about our medical department here. Uh, when, long, right? Do you feel tired when you're ill? You have to wait for 10 hours, 6 hours, 4 hours, 5 hours, yes? Even waiting at the clinic for a few hours, you get tired, right? No, you're going to wait there until the trumpet is being blown. You're going to wait at the kubur until the trumpet is being blown. If it is a comfortable wait, okay. Alhamdulillah. If it is not, our father Adam is still waiting for what? For the trumpet to be blown. He's still in barzakh. Right? Our prophet is still there. So how are we going to prepare ourselves for those times? Insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. I hope whatever is good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If not, it is from my own self. Seek your forgiveness until we meet again, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.